Nationally renowned as a tireless champion of evolution for over 25 years, she is a leading authority on creationism and intelligent design and one of their strongest opponents. She is the executive director of the National Center for Science Education, a not-for-profit organization of scientists, teachers, and people like you and me, devoted to defending the teaching of evolution and science. She's also the author of Why Intelligent Design is um, Wrong for Our Schools, or Not in Our Classrooms, and Evolution versus Creationism, which is now in its second edition. Okay, and to list all of her fellowships, awards, honors, TV appearances, interviews and publications would take us all day. But to note just a few highlights, she's the current president of the American Association of Physical Anthropologists, serves on the National Advisory Councils of Americans United for Separation of Church and State, and Americans for Religious Liberty, and is a fellow of the Committee for Skeptical Inquiry. She has been awarded the Defense of Science Award from the Center for Inquiry for her tireless leadership in defending scientific evolution and educational freedom the Isaac Asimov Science Award from the American Humanist Association, the First Amendment Award from the Playboy Foundation, and the James, the James Randi Award from the Skeptic Society. And perhaps most uh, prestigiously, uh, she has appeared on Penn & Teller's Showtime TV show, Bullshit! <laughs> All right, we are so privileged to have her with us today. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Eugenie Scott. Dave mentioned um, Darwin's most famous book on the origin of species, but people don't appreciate how many other books and monographs he wrote. He was an extraordinarily productive scientist. The only book people really know about is on the origin of species. It's a great book, but it, it's only one of many. And one, when I give Darwin Day talks, I kind of like to um, help people understand that a little bit because people don't realize what an enormously productive and broad scientist Charles Darwin actually was. He got back from the voyage of the Beagle. Um, of course, you're all familiar with um, the origin of species. He got back from the Beagle voyage in October of 36. By August of, 19, of 1837, he had completed his first book which actually wasn't published for another couple of years, but that was more because of Fitzroy than anything else. And his first book was a book on the, well, it was a travel log, really, but uh, and not just your average, and then we went to uh, the big island of the Galapagos. It was a travel log that had meticulously recorded observations of natural history from all over the world. And, and it's still, it still makes very good reading. But he whipped this little number out and nothing flat. And basically, he published a major um, scientific work every two or three years, basically, f until the end of his extremely productive life. And just for the fun of it, let's flip through a couple of these. He was also a geologist. Did you? Yeah, I'm just wondering, if the book was signed Charles Darwin M.A. Uh, Master of Arts. I thought he never finished a degree. I think it was an honorary degree, okay. but I would have to check that for sure. That'll give me something to look up. Um, he, was, he, he basically started off as a geologist, and Fitzroy brought him along uh, because he thought having a geologist would be very useful. And of course, he also wanted a gentleman companion because as a gentleman, he would not be able to have dinner with the crew and dinner with the um, officers who were not gentlemen, and there was kind of a shortage of gentlemen officers on the Beagle. And, you know, he, <laughs> Fitzroy was worried because mental illness ran in the family, and he was afraid that the enforced isolation of a several year long voyage might just make him, you know, snap. And so he thought if he had a, a gentleman to talk to and discuss, and, and Fitzroy was very interested in science. Fitzroy also collected a lot of specimens on the voyage of the, of the Beagle. Fitzroy was a very complex individual. But Fitzroy thought that having a geologist would be very helpful if you're going to be mapping new areas. And so the fact that, that uh, Darwin had a lot of background in geology was something that Fitzroy thought was very, uh, uh, very important. And um, Darwin's third book also had to do with geology and his fourth book. Mm -hmm. Then he got into his barnacle stage. Um, one of his professors had pointed out to him that 
you know, you'll be taken much more seriously as a biologist if you do some taxonomy. You need to do some systematics. And so he looked around and he discovered that barnacles were an, an animal group that really wasn't terribly well understood in terms of its systematics, in terms of the uh, varieties of um, barnacles that existed around the world and how they were related to one another, which is what the topic of systematics has to do with. So he spent a very long time um, studying, I think it was six, six or eight years, something like that, many, many years, studying, dissecting, looking at under the microscope, looking at the reproductive um, uh, stages of barnacles. I mean, he was, he was more knowledgeable about barnacles than anybody on the planet by the time he got done with this. And uh, indeed, um, these books are still um, uh, very useful for anyone studying this, this large class of, of organisms today. Did anybody count? Okay. This is the book you know about. Yeah. It was his ninth. Okay. He had a substantial history, he had a substantial reputation already as a scientist, as a geologist and as a skilled systematist after all the barnacles, by the time he wrote the book that we know him best for. Well, he could have sat back on his laurels, but he didn't. He continued to write and publish and research. And out there at Downhouse, uh, in his little uh, greenhouse that he built and his uh, various laboratories that he had, he conducted a large series of experiments. Um, he, would, he would breed pigeons, he would breed other animals, and he would conduct a variety of experiments to test his ideas. He was a very competent scientist. Um, he wasn't just a young kid who went around the, the world on a, on a boat, got seasick a lot, and then wrote a book about it. Uh, he was uh, very competent. He has had an extensive publication uh, series uh, in botany. Uh, nobody really thinks of him as being a specialist in botany, but his work on orchids is still considered definitive by people who um, are in this particular area of, of biology. <coughs> Uh, he made a number of discoveries about the nature of orchids, how they are fertilized, as this um, uh, title suggests, uh, and the various parts of insects that um, seem to be quite, see, the only word you could use is fitted. Um, the, the parts of the insects uh, perfectly match the parts of the flowers that they fertilize. And he even made a prediction uh, regarding a South American orchid that, that had a particularly unusually long um, distance between the area where um, the insect would, uh, bird or insect, the pollinator would land and where the, the pollen is, um, that a um, bird or an insect would be found with, with a very, very long uh, appendage that would allow, and he was right. Who says evolution is not a predictive science, right? He spent a lot of time on domesticated animals. He had two volumes on that. And then he got back to dealing with uh, the idea of evolution. And he dealt with the stickiest uh, topic of all, of course, which is human evolution. Um, the Expression of the Emotions in Man and Animals is a fascinating book. Darwin also made substantial contributions, you could argue, to psychology. And his, his, his observations were were very interesting. I, I'm sure biologists today uh, would have a number of, of ways and a number of reasons why they wouldn't agree with everything in, in Darwin's book. But still, the idea of systematically looking at emotion in animals as well as plants, the whole idea that animals had emotions was not universally accepted uh, in his time. So, you know, but this guy was very, very profound in, in the breadth of, of scientific interests that he had, uh, climbing plants. Um, self and cross fertilization, plant uh, reproduction. Um, lots of plant stuff. Nobody knows about that. Um, Phototaxis, another uh, movement. His last book was written in 1881. He died in 1882. Uh, he was a productive scientist up until the very end of his life. Certainly, no one would, no one who knows anything about Charles Darwin's scientific work would believe anything other than he was a very uh, productive scientist. So I just thought I'd walk you through a little bit of that, because I think probably a lot of you didn't know that. That's pretty cool. 
But what I want to talk about is, as the title of my talk um, uh, suggests, why Darwin matters. And Darwin matters because the work that he did and the ideas that he um, championed and that he developed and then championed are still relevant today because they were part of a revolution, really, in how we look not just at science, but how we look even at the relationship of human beings to the rest of nature. To understand um, um, where Darwin led us, it makes a certain amount of sense to uh, go back to what things were like before Darwin. And if we go way back, if we go back to the uh, pre-medieval period, uh, and even if we wish the um, period of the ancient Hebrews, the, the cosmological view is quite different uh, from that even of Darwin's time, but then changed further. Basically, the view of the ancient Hebrews and carried through, through much of the Middle Ages was that of a static universe and static in the sense of unchanged, and also a very Earth-centered universe. 